Okay, well, thank you very much, Professor Ulrika Schmidt, for agreeing to talk to me. Um, we're going to just ask you some things about, um, about your career and your feelings about what uh, is needed in the eating disorders field. Uh, but my first question is, uh, what, what brought you into the field? What brought you into eating disorders? It was essentially a series of very happy accidents. Um, there was no plan to go into eating disorders at all originally. Um, I will go back to my time at medical school where I was very, very torn as to whether to be a proper doctor in inverted <laughs> commas or to do some work in the mental health field. And I phrase it vaguely, the mental health field, because on the one hand, there was our psychiatry teaching and, and visiting psychiatric wards, which I experienced as very coercive and depressing and institutionalized. And I thought, I don't really want to do that. But we had one lecture a week, which was on a Friday at 5 p.m and which was the best attended lecture of all. There were over 200 medical students there, the mm. lecture theatre packed to the rafters. May I ask I, you where this was? In, in Germany, in Düsseldorf. Düsseldorf, okay. Yes, and this was a lecture by an eminent psychotherapist who would have conversations with patients, with people with often chronic, life-altering physical illnesses about their lives, about the impact of their illness on their lives. And it was very meaningful for the patients and for us as students to hear this. And I thought, that's the sort of thing I would like to be able to oh. do. Mm. And it really resonated with me, but I had no idea how, how to go to that, to that place and how to become that sort of person. Yeah. I was in the fortunate situation that I had the offer of a scholarship to go abroad for a year um, at the end of medical school. And my, my scholarship advisor said, we've heard these very good reports from the Maudsley Hospital in London. <laughs> Why don't you apply there? And so I did precisely that, came to the Maudsley for a year as a visiting foreign doctor. And I felt like a child in a sweet shop because there was suddenly a very <clears throat> different kind of psychiatry. You could, uh, there were all these different um, specialisms and different branches of psychiatry, psychology, um, and you could train in, in many of them. So I thought, this is where I want to do my training. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I went back to Germany, did a year in neurology, um, as, as a further foundation, but then came back and did my training at the Maudsley. And in that training, I really tried to learn as much as I could about psychological therapies, because I thought yeah. I don't just want to be the sort of psychiatrist who just gives out medications. Yeah. Yes, I of which there was a lot at that time. Yeah, could, could I just make one, one comment? Your English must have been pretty good by then. Um, it was okay, and mm. in terms of going to lectures, talking to people who spoke um, English in received pronunciation. Um, yeah. But I had great difficulties initially with people who were from Scotland, Ireland, yeah. from people of Afro-Caribbean heritage, right. um, people who had different accents and used different terminology. Yeah. And so um, what that meant was that when I practiced psychiatry early on, I had to take a one down position and say, uh, Can you help me. Mm understand and people would often respond very positively to that yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. so you trained at the Maudsley and uh, how did you get into this field then so I as I said I looked around I did six months of family therapy I did a stint of psychodynamic psychotherapy and I also um, worked with a man called Isaac Marx who is, of course, one of the pioneers of um, 
behavior therapy yeah. with anxiety disorders, OCD. And he really influenced me a lot early on because he was a passionate researcher, um, really dedicated to developing treatments and optimizing treatment for people with anxiety disorders and OCD. But mm. he was also a visionary in terms of really trying to empower patients. So he wrote a very um, good self-help book teaching patients the principles of behavior therapy and nice. to apply them themselves very early on when nobody else was doing this. Wow. He set up a training course to um, encourage nurses to deliver psychotherapy, which was unheard of at the time. Yes. Um, to really broaden access and to get specialist treatments out to people. Um, and he also on his ward had um, a, a flat for families to involve families as co-therapists in mm. treatment. Mm. So I learned a lot from him about how to do research into treatments, but also all these other things about how to give people access to, mm, to, mm. to treatment. And so I was originally fully sold on continuing to work with him. And then I did a small research project in eating disorders. And on the strength of this, Gerald Russell gave me a job as a researcher mm. um, on a big trial, which combined um, antidepressant therapy with um, CBT in bulimia nervosa. It was a drug company funded study. Um, and it actually taught me a lot about designing and the conduct of big um, mm. clinical trials because the drug company um, was very good at um, running this trial properly, um, lots of quality control measures. So all the sort of things that, that you need to do if you want to do good treatment research. But for me, it was also a real wonderful introduction to the field of eating disorders. I learned a lot about bulimia nervosa. I met so many people who had suffered in silence with bulimia for many years about the great shame that is often associated with mm -hmm. that condition. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of my time on that trial, I um, felt really more needed to be done to make cognitive behavioral treatments available to people because so many people with bulimia did not get access to treatment. So I mm. said to Janet Treasure, we should write a self-help book for people with bulimia, just mm. like Isaac Marx had done for mm. people with anxiety mm. and, and OCD. And Janet said, yes, let's do that. So I had all these stories of patients inside me mm. and I, I, I could write the chapters of this book very quickly and, and bring in a lot of the clinical material, mm. um, the stories of great courage, of triumph over adversity, of persistent working on mm. making changes. Yeah. And so um, our self-help book was written very, very quickly. I would write a chapter every two or three days, Janet would look at it, we bounce it between ourselves a bit more. And then we had our self-help book. And later on, we um, ran a number of trials on this book, um, using it um, with some clinician guidance and showing that actually giving guided self-help worked as well as giving a full course of cognitive behavioral therapy. Now that was not very popular in, in some circles really? because it was seen as delivering something that was perhaps a bit like painting by numbers or mm. something that was wooden or prescriptive. Mm. Interestingly, it was never the patients who said this. The, the <laughs> patients would, I, for many years, I got letters from patients saying, this book <clears throat> makes me feel so understood. It's been really helpful. It's, mm. been, it's allowed me to ask for help. It's allowed me to start making changes. So it, it was very interesting that the field was rather yeah. difficult. Yeah. 
And can I just ask you, uh, that original trial that uh, Gerald um, got you into, uh, wh when was that, without giving too much away? What, what sort of... That was in was that? the um, 1980s, sort of. OK, so that was very soon after Bulimia Nervosa had been even identified. Yeah, late 1980s, that's right, yes. And yeah. this was the time when we would get GP letters um, with the word bulimia nervosa spelled in very funny ways <laughs> and saying, I think it might be this. I have ex investigated this patient to the hilt in terms yeah. of gastroenterological problems. They don't have gastroenterological problems. I yeah. think it might be this new condition. Yes. Right. Okay. So you're in eating disorders and, and uh, what were the, give, give me the sort of the main influences after that. That, uh, that formed your career? So the main influences after that, I had to leave eating disorders for five years after um, finishing this stint as a researcher, mm. uh, finishing my PhD, which I did alongside this research post. There were just no jobs in eating disorders anywhere. So I worked in community psychiatry for five years. Mm. Um, very interesting experience. I wouldn't miss it. Um, mm. but I kept an interest in eating disorder research and I continued to develop guided self-help. I um, worked with Chris Williams from the University of Glasgow. Um, mm. We were the first people to do trials on um, online guided mm. self-help. Again, this was quite controversial at the time. Therapists shook their heads and thought this would drive patients further into isolation and, and not help them come forward. And it was the opposite. And yeah. in fact, it, yeah. it opened up avenues for, for patients. And yeah. I'm very pleased that guided self-help now is a first-line treatment, nice recommended first-line treatment. Sure. Um, sure. So that was kind of one part of my, my work. Um, but after my stint in community psychiatry, I came back to eating disorders at the Maudsley as a consultant, um, and that's um, 25 years or so ago, and mm. I've been working in eating disorders ever since. Mm. Um, and I then got more interested also working as a consultant in eating disorders in trying to develop treatments for anorexia nervosa. And that's really where the whole work on mantra originates, um, mm. which again, I co-developed with Janet and with very talented colleagues from psychology, Helen Startup, Tracy Wade um, had a hand in this as, as well. And this was a different kettle of fish because at the time there were no um, treatments around that were specifically designed for adults with anorexia nervosa, individual therapies. Mm -hmm. People had done some trials where they had used off the shelf other psychotherapies for anorexia nervosa, but we tried to develop a specific model, a cognitive interpersonal model um, that really tried to look at how was anorexia kept going, how was it maintained in adults with anorexia, to try to um, intervene with some of these maintaining factors. Yeah, yes. I mean, I'd be interested to know how you came up with uh, with your um, mantra model of, um, of, of eating disorders, because uh, I think it's, um, I, I personally think it's really brilliant, uh, but it'd be interesting, interesting to know how you came up with it. So it was a very, very iterative process. Um, it, it, it started with clinical discussions, with a literature review of some of the things that might be contributing and picking up on research interests at the time. So there were things to do with, um, there was a lot of research interest in the valued nature of anorexia, um, and how anorexia was really quite different from other disorders um, in terms of people seeing the downside of their difficulties, but also really valuing aspects of it and to try to bring, to bring that somehow into the therapy and to help them think about 
um, ways in which what they valued about their anorexia, they might get in other ways. So pa patients mm -hmm. telling us that anorexia makes them feel very safe or that it helps them to show other people how they feel without actually having to express their emotions and mm. that it allows them to both protect others' feelings and express what they're saying, um, what, 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 what they need without really um, doing so. And yeah. to help people move on from that. So that was one um, big part of it. Mm. But the other bit of it was that we were increasingly becoming aware that families often inadvertently were keeping anorexia going and that there were particular um, thinking and emotional styles and interpersonal styles that might be contributing. The whole field of um, understanding emotional and interpersonal um, interactions in anorexia was very under research at the time. So we developed the model in parallel to doing research on theory of mind in anorexia, um, the perception of emotion, the experience of emotion, mm. expression of emotion in anorexia, what trying to further what we know about emotion regulation in anorexia. And actually what's very clear is that people with anorexia often try to regulate emotions by avoiding um, both the experience and the expression of emotions. And so Mantra was designed to help people become more able to, to mm. use their emotions in the service of expressing their needs. Yeah, yeah. But it's been a, 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 an ongoing pro, a pro mm. project. It's still not a fully mature therapy, mm. I would say. We can still make it a lot better. Um, what we have found is that patients really like it because again, we have we've used some of the experience of of doing the bulimia self help mm. manual in terms of producing the manual that is the workbook that is part of mantra and it makes people very safe to have a book to go alongside the treatment I see. Um, and to kind of give people a structure that they can follow and it is em empowering to them as well yeah, and it is yeah. something that they can share with others mm, mm. but it's only the starting point for helping them then um, to break down some of the maintaining factors of their illness. Right. One thing you mentioned was, um, was that sometimes families inadvertently keep the uh, eating disorder going. Yeah. And uh, I've been aware of a sort of... Con it's, um, uh, it's a sort of a different difference of view. I mean, some, some, some people say, and they, they publish this, that, um, you know, families um, do not cause anorexia and they're, and they're not... They're not to blame, um, which of course I agree with. Um, uh, <clears throat> but that, I, I think that's made some people a bit wary of saying anything about the family. Mm -hmm. uh, but you and Janet have um, have been able to do that, and I wonder how you how you balance that with with the the general sort of feeling that we shouldn't be um, uh, criticizing families. I would say absolutely we should not criticize families and I mm. think in all of our writing and in the way in which we talk to patients and their families that will be abundantly clear that we feel the family are there to help and support they're part of the solution usually yeah um yeah. and I do a lot of work on early intervention, working with um, young people with, with anorexia and other eating disorders. And it's always such a relief when you have the family on board helping. Mm. So I think um, it's an absolute no brainer that families are our strongest allies um, usually. 
Sure, sure. And I agree. Well, that, that is the sort of position of the, uh, you know, remember there was a paper in the, um, uh, in the International Journal of Eating Disorders, uh, which is saying, you know, we, we believe that, um, that um, you know, the, the, this idea of, uh, of um, saying that families to blame is completely wrong. And of course, we both agree with that. Yeah. Um, but how do you balance that by saying, yes, but sometimes you do things which are um, not helpful? Well, you can explore it with families. Do you think this might be the case? Mm. And I think very often families readily accept that. But yeah. also when we see patients individually, we talk with them about what the family, uh, what what the anorexia might be doing to the interaction with other people, including their family or their partners. And so we talk about it within the individual setting and with it when we bring families in. And usually there's a, there's a lot of agreement that, mm. yes, um, families can get drawn into the illness. Sure. Yeah. I think the important thing uh, from what you've said is is not to shy away from those things um, and to help to try and help the families in a way cope with uh, having somebody with an eating disorder in the family and you know, some and so, some people cope in ways which maybe are not that helpful and and, need, and they need help with that. No, I agree. That's great. Um, can you tell me what you're most proud of in, in your career so far? You know, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> I would say I, I am proud of the fact that the guided self-help and the mantra both are nice recommended first-line treatments. But I'm also immensely proud of FREED, our early intervention um, model. Um, I, I've led the development of FREED um, <clears throat> We, we started with this work eight years ago, and it's gone from strength to strength. We had a little pilot project um, in 2014, just within our service, um, setting up this early intervention um, service model and care pathway for young people who come into our service for the very first time, who have a relatively short illness duration and really trying to get across to them that early on in the illness, a lot of the changes they're experiencing to um, their bodily functions, to their behavior are very malleable and changes in the brain are very malleable. And that really the more we can help them to get stuck in there early with making changes to their nutrition and to other things, um, that the more likely they have a chance of just being able to get on with their lives quickly. So we developed mm -hmm. a lot of resources around that and also all the practicalities, structures, processes, procedures to really get young people through our service very quickly in a way that was very person-centered and very developmentally tailored to young adults, emerging adults who are sort of launching themselves into adulthood. Yeah. And the outcomes were <laughs> beyond my, my wildest beliefs. I've done mm. lots of clinical trials and you're always delighted if you find a little difference between yes. treatment yeah. A and treatment B. But here we compared people who had gone through our free program with very similar young people who we'd seen previously. And the, um, for example, weight recovery in anorexia was 60% at one year with a free program compared to below 20% wow. in, in, in young people who had had the usual sort of waiting time, slow start. To mm, mm. So a really big difference. Yeah, oh, I totally agree. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. And I suppose we, we, we English people should, uh, and thinking a bit of Brexit, should really be very grateful to our German colleagues, you and Berta, um, for showing us um, early intervention and daycare can be really um, helpful and groundbreaking. So thank you. And I think the nice thing about FREED is we have now replicated the findings in larger studies with, with more services. It's 
being rolled out in all the um, eating disorder services in England currently. We've almost completed this work. Um, so it is here to stay and hopefully will be just like early intervention in psychosis, that it's really yeah, yeah. Uh, an important and key part of what eating disorder services mm. deliver. Um, but we need to make it much bolder and brainier and get it to be even earlier. Um, yeah. And that will be the next challenge. Totally agree. And where do you think eating disorders is going or where do you think it should go? No, that's that's the question. Where do you think it should be going? What where do you where do you think uh, research money and clinical money should be placed in the future? Okay. Yeah. So I think firstly, um, there is a lot more work to be done around early intervention. And by this, I mean, when we look to the psychosis field, they have done a lot of work in cohorts, large cohorts of people who present for the first time, looking at um, their recovery trajectories, for example. And we're going to do some of this work in a big project called Edify, which is a, a big early intervention consortium. So I think a lot more work and research money should be going towards early detection, early treatment, and figuring out who responds to what early on, who might need a little extra, what can we do to really um, get it right early on with young people who are on an eating disorder trajectory. But in parallel to that, we also want to know much more about who is at risk, and there have been a lot of prevention studies, but they've focused mainly on psychosocial risk factors. And we need to become much better at doing risk factor work that also that goes across biological and psychosocial risk factors. And mm -hmm. within our Edify consortium, we're going to do a lot of work looking at those neurobiological risk factors in cohorts of young people who, where there is genetic information available, neuroimaging data available at a young age before they develop an eating disorder. Mm. How and young do you mean from, with, with that? What, what sort of age are you talking about? So we are in collaboration with Dr. Sil uh, Professor, Professor Sylvain Desrivières, who leads uh, a large cohort of um, adolescents who were um, first investigated at age 14 and who are now in their 20s. So they are now in the in this sort of uh, just past the peak risk period mm. um, of developing an eating disorder and they have neuroimaging data from from age. <coughs> and what we can uh, what we have already shown is that there are some um, neural markers of some people being at higher risk of developing bulimic type eating disorders later. So we find <clears throat> indicators at age 14 for who might be at risk of developing an eating disorder by age 16. How this will then translate into prevention um, of eating disorders and other related psychopathology that remains to be seen but it's 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 it's, oh, it's after bringing together neurobiological work and also psycho psychological risk factors yeah and just thinking completely outside the box outside that study which sounds fantastic but um do you think there's any there might be any um a mileage in going even earlier i mean uh, should we be looking at um, infants? Absolutely. Um, and this might be infants of mothers who themselves mm. have had an eating disorder. So there are there is a lot more that we should be thinking about in terms of early intervention, prevention, identifying young people who might be at risk and then thinking about developing targeted interventions mm. for different age groups as well. Yeah, yes. Okay. Well, that's been fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. Good.
So we'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, I'll just um, turn it off.